This is Angela Ackerman, and you are watching the TV Writer Podcast. Hosted by Gray Jones, the TV Writer Podcast is brought to you by Script Magazine and ScriptMag.com, the leading source for script writing information in print and on the web. My name is Gray Jones, and I want to welcome you to the TV Writer Podcast, partner of Script Magazine, Episode 70. Well, today I have an interview with Angela Ackerman, and she is the author of The Emotion Thesaurus, a book that I would highly, highly recommend as a resource for your writing, whether you write novels, whether you write screenplays or teleplays, excellent, excellent resource. Angela Ackerman, a little bit about her. She lives in Calgary, Alberta, my hometown, with her husband and two teen boys. She's a lover of mystery and mythology, and her chapter books, the middle grade and young adult novels, are represented by Jill Corcoran of the Herman Agency. Angela is also the co-author of The Emotion Thesaurus, a writer's guide to character expression, a unique writing resource that tackles the show-don't-tell aspect of character emotion. A strong believers, a believer in writers helping writers, Angela teaches workshops, runs critique groups through online and in person, and blogs at the award-winning resource The Bookshelf Muse. You should definitely look that up. It's a description hug, hub for writers, editors, and teachers. You're going to love the interview. We'll get to that in a second. Um, I do want to remind you that there's lots of great resources at tvwriterpodcast.com, including links to hundreds of free scripts, including pilots, unproduced pilots, um, TV specs, and, and, and Bibles. There's also a TV Writer Twitter database on the website, and 70 podcast interviews with lots of great writers. Uh, you can always go back to my New Year's blog for a cheat sheet that tells you about different podcasts for different needs and also different books that I recommend and also goal setting resources. I'd encourage you to look for that and read that article. A reminder to check out TV Writer Chat every Sunday evening at 9.30 p.m. Eastern, 6.30 p.m. Pacific. And also make sure you follow me on Twitter at Gray Jones is my handle for all the latest news. I'm really excited to welcome a new podcast sponsor. Actually, not so new because they were a sponsor last year as well. This is the Toronto Screenwriting Conference. Now, by Toronto, you may think it's just for Toronto or just for Canada. Not at all. Last year's conference, there were plenty of people from the United States and even other countries as well. And I highly, highly recommend it. Um, last year alone, they had Graham Yost, who was, of course, the creator of Justified. Dean Dubois did an amazing session. He's the writer of How to Train Your Dragon um, as well. Great authors like Chris Vogler, Dara Marks, and Sheldon Bull. Uh, many of the people who've been actually on the podcast, Sheldon Bull had an interview on the podcast as well. Jana Sinyan the creator of Being Erica, David Barlow as well. And it was just an amazing, inspiring experience. There's networking sessions, and uh, I highly, highly recommend it. Can't say enough good things about it, especially it's actually a quite a reasonable conference uh, money-wise, so, so that's, that's a factor as well. But you can come to it April 6th and 7th. Go to the website, torontoscreenwritingconference.com for more details and make sure you sign up for the the mailing list because they they send out emails as soon as they find out which speakers are booked they haven't released them yet but they will be be announcing that over the next few weeks do sign up for that newsletter right now they actually have an early bird registration so take advantage of that torontoscreenwritingconference.com highly recommended now on to my interview with angela ackerman enjoy This is Gray, and I'm here with Angela Ackerman, author of The Emotion Thesaurus. How are you doing, Angela? I'm doing great. How are you? I'm doing very well, thanks. And I appreciate you taking the time to do this interview, um, because I think your book is a hidden gem. And the reason I say hidden is because, and you could tell me, you didn't really intend this necessarily for screenwriting, did you? Um, it's, it's interesting, because... Um, not specifically did we have screenwriters in mind, more writers in general, mm -hmm. but um, clearly body language is very visual. And so it has a huge application to screenwriters, even actors. Mm. And since writing it, we have noticed that a lot of screenwriters have really glommed onto it as a resource for them. Mm. Very, very cool. And, and you are hailing from Calgary, Alberta, which is my hometown, which is pretty cool. 
oh, that's neat. I didn't realize that. Yeah. Um, and so what, what are you, before we get into the book and all that kind of thing, why don't you tell me a little bit about yourself? Um, how did you get into this? How, how did you get into writing and, and what's, what's your history here? Well, I've always loved reading, uh, always loved escaping into books. When I was a child, I had, uh, you know, kind of a difficult, rough integration in school and stuff like that. So for me, it represented escapism. Mm -hmm. And growing up, I wanted to sort of pass that on to someone else. I wanted to write for other people and offer them a way to escape or entertain or inform whatever I could do. And um, I have always loved writing for kids. I've always, as my kids were growing, I would tell them stories. So it just sort of became this natural progression that I should try writing stories for children, which is what I mainly write for fiction. I write for uh, the, the middle grade and young adult audiences. Mm -hmm. And uh, as I became more interested in writing and more determined to pursue it on a professional level, I realized that uh, I was really bad at it. I had a lot to learn. <laughs> I'm sure that's a very common theme with most, most writers. We mm -hmm. think that we have all these wonderful ideas and we want to get them down on paper and people will love them. But the reality is, is we need to back up that imagination with, with craft and, mm. and to really learn how to write the elements of, of craft well. So um, I joined a critique group online. I, up to that point in time, I didn't know anyone else who were writers. I felt really insecure about saying I was a writer, uh -huh. but I realized I needed some help. I needed support of other people. I needed knowledge of other people to sort of grow as a writer myself. Um, through interaction with other people, I met my co-author, and uh, we sort of formed a, an online group that just really helped support each other, and we got to talking about the, the things we were struggling with the most. And I would say there's a huge universal struggle with um description in general but especially emotion description mm. because we tend to get stuck on these repetitive gestures the sort of cliche expressions the the head shaking the nodding the smiling the um shortness of breath the, the ways to describe emotion that we do over and over and over and you see it a mm -hmm. lot in writing and we were really struggling with a way to find fresh ways to express what our characters are feeling so that readers really felt involved, really were feeling empathy for the characters. And, uh, my, uh, my co-author and I, we just decided to start a blog together and start writing down lists of ways writers could express different emotions, different mm. ways that they might express it physically through body language, ways that they might express it internally as visceral sensations, those deep, or fight or flight responses um, that we have no control over, but are very powerful in writing. And then, of course, the thought aspect, you know, what goes through a character's mind when they're experiencing a specific emotion, because mm. there is a specific pattern of thoughts that go with any emotion. Very and, cool. Um, yeah, amazingly, it just became this hugely popular thing. All these writers were coming out of the woodwork with the same issues. They were all struggling in the same area. And um, it just kind of ballooned from there. People kept asking us, when would we turn it into a book? You know, where are we going to turn it into a book? And we just finally decided, okay, <laughs> there's clearly a need. There's no resource like this out there. We're going to provide this and really help writers with this area of writing. Very cool. And, th and that resource was called The Bookshelf Muse? Uh, it's a blog called mm -hmm. The Bookshelf Muse. Yeah. And I sort of describe it as a description hub for writers because... The Emotion Thesaurus started there, but mm -hmm. it's only one of the thesaurus collections that we have. We have one for setting, which looks at all the sensory details that you might find in settings. So things you would see, things you would smell, things your character would taste, touch, or hear while they're in a particular setting. And we have one for symbolism. We have one for weather. We have one for character traits. Um, we have one for... Um, uh, colors and textures and shapes. So just any aspect of description that a character, that a, pardon me, that a writer might be struggling with, trying to find that perfect simile, that perfect metaphor, or just a perfect comparison or way to express something to show it to the readers, mm -hmm. he can help you brainstorm to find something that'll fit your situation that your character's in perfectly. Neat stuff. It, it sounds like you got more books coming. <laughs> Yeah, that's kind of what happened is we wrote this one and, and everyone is like, okay, so which one's next? Are you going <laughs> to into a book? So 
Yes, currently we are working at adapting uh, another one of the the sources that's quite popular on the blog called the character trait the source. And uh, because it's so huge, there's so many character traits, both positive and negative, we've decided to create two books out of this one the source, one for the positive attributes of a mm-hmm. character and one for the, the flaws. Interesting. And our goal is just simply to get writers really thinking about how they can create really complex, rounded characters with both flaws and attributes and where those came from, not just, you know, splatter effect and, you know, make them honest, but give them this particular flaw. Really think about why am I going to choose that he's really honest? Why is honesty important to him? What happened in his past that brought that particular attribute out or what brought out that particular flaw? We want authors really to think about these things to make these complex complex characters that readers will really feel connected to and feel empathy for. Very, very cool. Well, I do I do want to talk about um, the Emotion Thesaurus, but um, before we do, where can people find the Bookshelf Muse? Uh, the Bookshelf Muse, you can find just, you can type in the Bookshelf Muse, Muse in Google. It'll come up right away. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's at Blogspot, so www.thebookshelfmuse.com dot blogspot dot com. Mm, that sounds like an excellent, excellent resource. Um, and uh, and I sh- we should mention your you mentioned your partner a couple times. Um, Becca Pugliese is uh, the yeah, name of Puglisi. your. Yeah, uh, Pugliese. How do you how do you pronounce that? Pugliese. Pugliese. Okay. Um, and so uh, and she's also the co-author of of this book. So let, let's let's move on to um, to the emotion thesaurus. So okay. I I know in screenwriting. We're told to show, not tell, and and I I'm guessing, and what I'm what I what I got from your book is that this is also something that people talk about in in novels as well. But um, I know from a screenwriting perspective, the way we often interpret that is actions. So show, not tell. We want to show the car blowing up instead of telling about that. We want to show things happening, but really it's characters that drive the story and so show not tell might be as simple as somebody cracking their knuckles it might be something as simple as curling a lip it might it might be um something that is rather than saying joe is angry it might be something as simple as as a non-cliched way of showing that anger emotion. And, uh, and something I, I love at the beginning of your book is you mentioned about how 95% of communication is non-verbal, which would, which would tell us as we're writing a script that if we, if we are only showing words, we're leaving out 95% of what's going on. Um, so, so tell me about, about that aspect. Uh, well, screenwriters actually have it even harder than novelists because novelists can use point of view to really get inside a, a character's head and sort of express those thoughts and those internal sensations that are going on. Whereas a screenwriter, it's all exterior. As you said, it's everything is shown. It's through action. It's through tension. That's how you show a lot of the showing aspect. You have to communicate what the character is feeling only by what is seen and what is heard. So dialogue and the body language becomes incredibly important when you're a screenwriter. Um, mm-hmm. It's it, one thing that I love about movies is dialogue is so witty and so well done. And the reason for this is because you really have to do a lot with dialogue. It's true in books, but it's especially true, I think, in film. Dialogue is a huge component of showing emotion. And there's ways to tell emotion in dialogue clearly as well. You can explain how you feel or you can explain that so-and-so said this. That's all telling. But it's more how you can say something without saying it or sometimes what a character doesn't say. You've shown something in a scene and what a character chooses not to say can often speak to the audience as to how they're feeling inside. But definitely the biggest part of showing, I believe, is is that physical component showing the body language of a character what they choose to do speaks a lot about how they feel and who they are as well Mm -hmm. i mean we all we all have different things that motivate us but one of the biggest motivators is not being hurt not um, to stay safe that that the flight or flight response and so depending on whatever's going on around us 
we're always going to have that at the forefront of our minds. How do I stay safe? How do I keep safe? Mm -hmm. And so the actions of the character are going to be, a, they're going to respond to whatever's happening in the scene. Yeah. And, and, and I think um, if we were to think through our, our conversations with people, um, it's not just about the extreme anger or the extreme sadness. I, I know, say for instance, with, with myself, one one thing I do, I, I have this nervous habit that if I um if I'm in a conversation and somebody's I really want to say something, I, I start kind of um massaging my hands. <laughs> and it's just something I do when when I'm in a conversation that shows my emotion and and that's particular to me, but that it, that's not necessarily an extreme emotion, but there's still an action to it. Absolutely. Micro expressions are something that uh, you can definitely show much better on screen than you can in a book. Uh, when you try to break down a um, particular movements too much in a book, it, it can get long, it can slow the pace and stuff like that. But on the screen, you can just see it happen. You can zoom in on someone's face and watch their eyes tighten. And you, you get a communication from that. You understand what they're feeling. But definitely, emotion does not have to be extremes. It does not have to be these big, grand gestures. It can be little things. It can be a combination of several little things. And uh, little things have a lot of power, I think. Mm -hmm. And and also, um, this is great for rewriting as well. Um, one of the things that comes up a lot with, with writers, especially beginning writers, uh, I just had somebody ask me on Twitter yesterday. Um, they said, I showed my friend my script and they said the dialogue was flat. And the um, the instinct with that is, okay, if they say it's flat dialogue, I've got to do something with the dialogue. Well, maybe the dialogue was flat because it didn't feel real, because the f characters weren't acting properly for what that di dialogue was saying. Um, maybe some of the dialogue could have been cut and replaced with actions, and that would actually make the dialogue seem better, even though you d maybe didn't even change a word of the dialogue. Um, Absolutely. Yeah, I think they work together. I think they both work together really well. Mm -hmm. And um, dialogue, one thing to remember about it when looking at film and, and screen on the screen is that it's also how you say something, not just what you say. And so tone of voice becomes very important. It can convey a lot of different things. You can slow down your words when you're really thinking something through, or you can speed up when you're kind of nervous or really intent on getting an idea out, you can pause, you can add those ums and hesitations. You can make gestures with your face that, you know, you're biting your lip, like you're really don't want to say something, but you do. Those things can come across really well in, mm -hmm. in dialogue on the screen. Yep. And, and also an, another thing that this, this can do is um, there's this big thing with actors that actors don't like to they don't like parentheticals uh in, in scripts parentheticals are little adverbs that are put on on the dialogue that say that they say this angrily or or they 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 try to give a quick direction to the actor to do it a certain way actors generally don't like those because they're very blunt and they're mm -hmm. very flat um but they do need something to work with and so if you if you said something like tightness in the eyes that gives the actor something to to work with that feels creative, that doesn't feel like they're just bluntly um, hit over the head with something. I think that actors probably suffer the same thing as writers do, and that is a, a limitation in ways to express a particular emotion. It doesn't always come immediate how you want to express something, especially when you really are reaching to create something that's very unique to this particular character. And I imagine that, you know, actors, they have their stock movements and gestures, but when they're trying to really reach deep and create something that's really strongly adapted to just this character, a book like The Emotion Thesaurus works just as it does with a writer. It's a brainstorming guide. You read through the lists of all the different gestures and it sort of spontaneously brings up all these ideas in your head as to how you could express it. Mm -hmm. You know, it's not a, it's not a cut and paste sort of tool. It's more just to get you thinking. 
And I actually have heard from um, acting coaches who have recommended this book to actors to use. So I find that interesting how many applications this book has. Yeah. Well, and, and, and it's very true. And, and um, one, one another script problem that comes up is that, um, and I actually was just reading a script this week, and all of a sudden, a character just did something that felt completely out of context. And that that was a case where the um, the action that the writer wrote, he I mean, he was trying to write an action, but it wasn't fitting the emotion that he was trying to tell. And I think that's that's another great use of of the books, uh, uh, how you you basically give a whole bunch of different reactions for different uh, that are physical signals for for different emotions. But one one of the things that it can help with is it, it also tells you what's not a reaction. Like it, as as you read through all the things that could possibly be happening when a person is 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 feeling something, you get an idea. Okay, well they wouldn't do this, they wouldn't do that, which can be helpful for for consistency of the emotions as well. Definitely, and again, this comes back to who the individual character is. I mean, someone who is very confident, very outgoing very energetic, they're going to express emotions in a certain way. Whereas someone who is more introverted, shy, um, self-destructive, they're going to express the same emotion in a completely different way. And it will also take different emotional extremes to bring out an expression. So for, for one person who is scared, I mean, seeing a spider, you know, doesn't even bother them. But somebody else who maybe has a phobia about spiders, they're going to freak right out. Mm -hmm. And you have to think about that as you tailor emotion to your particular character. How would my character react in this situation? Yeah. What is the emotional range? And that, and that leads to a danger that you describe in the book, which is the danger of melodrama. Tell me about oh, that. Oh, yes. Yeah. Melodrama is a game where... There, we try too hard as writers to really pound out an emotion and we clog the writing with all these, you know, heart bursting out of the chest and tears pouring down the face and cracking voice and too much. Mm. Like it just, it's over the top. And what happens is the reader will disengage right. because they'll, whenever they spot the writing, they'll disengage. They'll go, eh, that's a little over the top, I think. Or if you have a, a traumatic event that's happening over a long period of time, it is really hard to maintain that sort of in, emotional intensity. Hmm. So you really have to make sure that, again, you're really aware of that particular character's emotional range so that you can sort of build up to a, to a response rather than have it immediately, they're crying, they're screaming, and it just goes on for pages and pages and pages. Hmm. It just, it'll pull the reader right out of the story, unfortunately. That's a, that's a great point. It, it's almost creating dynamics in the story, um, just like dynamics of music. Uh, uh, a, a music piece is not necessarily emotionally moving if it's at full blast right from the start. It it gradually goes up and down and up and down and up and down, leading to the climax at the end. And when we've had that that sort of wave pattern throughout the the music piece then by the time we get to the end we're kind of expecting it and we're excited about it and it and that's when we can really get that that movement i think sometimes people think if my script is not emotionally moving i have to just blast the reader with these extreme emotions and and that that's even worse absolutely absolutely um it can be I think emotion can be very subtle and still have a lot of power. Mm -hmm. And a big part of emotion is sort of reaching out into the reader and pulling the reader reader's own experiences out of them. Mm. So connecting in a way where this person is experiencing this emotion. I remember when I felt that way and I felt the same way. And that's where that authenticity comes in, that you really want to strive to create body language and uh, dialogue that really speaks to the character. And so they are reminded of their own past experiences. And that sort of pulls them in even more into whatever's happening. It's like they're experiencing the emotion themselves on one level. Mm. And, uh, and one other thing, which I think is really cool, and on this point, um, you, you mentioned in your book, Less is More. 
And a, a lot of that is specificity. If you can get really, really specific about something, it doesn't take much. So say for instance, um, if, if you can have a, uh, it, uh, I'm going to use a cliche here, but slamming a door. But once you know that that guy, that, that the character slams the door, you've been very specific with that. That's all you need. Um, and you can, and you can then get to his angry dialogue. Um, just one description, if it's specific enough, can, um, can give us the direction without having to go over and over and over again. But the, the other point that I would make with the, from a script perspective is, um, often when a reader is reading a script, they get put off if there's long sections of dialogue. They also get put off if there's long sections of description. So what we're talking about here is also something that helps from a reading perspective in the script. You're you're more likely going to to have the reader engaged and more likely to have the reader um, approve of your script if if these little descriptions of emotion are in there because they help the flow of of the story as well. Definitely. I think that that is a pacing issue where there's uh, a block of too much dialogue or too much description in novels. It's often too much um, thoughts, introspection going on. Hmm. And those things can definitely slow down the entire scene. Hmm. And um, it can help. It can it can create a disconnect in the reader and or in the viewer. And they don't you know, they get bored or they start thinking about other things. Hmm. So using less to say more is is often a great way to keep things going, especially for a movie because, or, or a TV show where you only have a limited amount of time to get the storyline across. Mm. And and also another another thing actually that uh, really came across to me as I as I was reading it is that you could use this as a scene tool. And one of the things that that is a complaint with scripts, not just the dialogue being flat. But just the scripts themselves are flat. And and I think people think again that they have to make the dialogue more extreme. They have to amp up the emotions um, in order to in, – and, and then they get frustrated because it doesn't work. But what what was really coming across, coming across to me as I was reading through the, the emotion thesaurus is let's just say a person um, has a closed body posture. That's not necessarily an extreme example. That's not necessarily um, a cliched uh, gesture. But as an actor, if I was looking at that scene and all of, us, all of a sudden I see that the other character is closing their body posture, I'm going to react to that. And that's going to provoke a reaction in me, which is going to be something else. And then that body language is going to provoke something in the other actor and there's an action reaction that can go on and and so this can also be a very helpful tool for trying to picture even what the actors are going to be doing in the scene and how this this physicality is going to manif manifest itself absolutely i mean as humans we are body language experts and this is something that a lot of writers you know they need to be reminded of we all every single day pick up so much more by other people's body language, what they're doing or what they're not doing than we do from what they tell us. You know, you can, you can tell me about something like uh, your, your new granddaughter and I can hear things in your voice and stuff like that. But if you and I are in the same room, your body is going to be telling me all these different things. And in turn, you're right. We react to it. And then our bodies respond Mm -hmm. This happens with the with the person who's watching the TV show or watching the the movie as well. They learn to pick up on these body cues because it's what they've done their whole entire life, and that's what can make a, a physical display of emotion so powerful. Is that you don't need to explain it, you don't need to go to extremes. Mm. And so, so how can we use this as a stepping stone to increase our powers of observation as writers? I think uh, one really great way is to observe people. You hear it all the time that it's always good to, to listen in on conversations, to watch people, to see how they do things. And there's real wisdom behind it. Everybody has their own particular gestures, like you were saying with, um, you know, when you massage your hands when you want to speak. 
everybody has those little quirks that are just belong to them and they help us sort of brainstorm new ways to express. Another way is to think about our own, uh, our own pasts when we've experienced a certain emotion Mm -hmm. and what it felt like, what we did when we felt that emotion. And it's okay to like get up out of your chair, away from the screen, walk around and sort of try to recreate that past event that happened and just really pay attention to what your body is doing. Because even just a memory, if it's strong enough, it will bring all those feelings back that we felt back then. And it really helps us get in tune with a particular emotion. And then we take that and we put it onto the page. We write it into our characters. And so that's a, another really great way to just uh, really create authentic emotion. Hmm. I think I think a third way is to have the character really interact with their scene, with their setting. Mm. No setting should be static, and you should never pick a setting just because you need something to happen. I mean, if you need a conversation to happen between two teenage characters, you shouldn't just pick the hallway because it's a, it's a location in a school and it would it's where they might meet. There should be meaning attached to the setting, and if you can do that and show why the character is reacting to that meaning in this in the setting like perhaps it reminds them of some traumatic thing that happened like if they were in a hallway maybe the week before one of the characters you know was slammed into the locker by somebody and completely humiliated in front of the whole entire school when characters are reintroduced into an environment where there's some symbol in that environment that reminds them of something either positive or negative it will affect their emotions and Mm. it affect how they feel and what they interact with in that setting. So I think that, um, especially in TV and and screen, it's great to infuse your setting with intent and symbols that are going to pull your character in certain emotional ways and is going to encourage that physical expression and interaction. Mm. And you know, that, that brings to mind something really, really important. I feel in, in the writing process, um, and that's the, and I used to, I used to play piano and, uh, I learned a lot about muscle memory and sort of the gray matter, um, in, in doing so. Um, I, I found coming back to the piano after a long time, I could actually play a song better with my eyes closed than with them open, which sounds bizarre. Um, but I wouldn't remember the song properly if I was relying on my conscious thought. I would remember the song if I just let the, the body memory take over. And and where this applies with writing is most often when we're writing, we're sitting down at a computer. And I think when we do that, we're only accessing a certain part of our muscle memory. And, uh, and I think it can be really, really invigorating when you're writing to get up and walk around, sort of that uh, in Dead Poet Society when... Um, when Robin Williams said, stand on your desk, like go to a different vantage point. And, and that can actually bring out different types of muscle memory, different types of emotion memory. Um, one of the things you mentioned, these locations is actually going to a location. If it's, if it's a story set in the school, actually going to the school, walking around the school can probably bring about, bring out emotions for you that you would never think of when you were sitting at your desk. Absolutely. Absolutely. I strongly encourage people to change a venue or to get, like you say, get up away from the computer and walk around and sort of imagine these scenes in their head and think about how they might play out. If you can, um, you know, go somewhere where you can be in the same setting, you know, if you're, if it's in a park or if it's in a mall or a school, like go to those places and just really kind of immerse yourself in, in the in the sensory details that are all around you, the sounds and the smells. And they do pull out that muscle memory, I agree, and they will bring out those emotions in ourselves. And if we can draw from our own personal experiences and emotions and create something that's really unique and authentic for the character, I think that's great. Mm-hmm. Now, you uh, you did mention something that I think is, is particularly um, applicable for, for scripts, which is the danger of misusing backstory. Tell me a bit about that. Um, backstory is a difficult one because especially at the start of anything I find 
we're, we feel all this pressure that we have to pull the reader in or we have to pull the viewer in right away and show them all these things about the character and what happened to them and why they're like they are the way now. And the problem with it is that it can just completely kill the pace and or it can create boredom and you'll actually do the opposite instead of pulling the person in closer to the storyline you're actually pushing them away because they're just they're not that interested they want stuff to happen they want action and as i said before often it's what a character does that's more important than than what happened in the past um some people can really use certain things to um, kind of play on empathy a bit. Uh, you know, you can set up a story where the character character's parents have just died and, and they, they move to a different town and all these different things. You can sh explain all of that and try to use it to draw the reader in, make them feel sorry for the character. But those are kind of more devices mm. and aren't very they aren't as good as, as showing the character how they act despite those things that happen to them. Mm. You can feel sorry for someone because their parents died, or you can feel sorry for someone because they just went through a divorce, but it's what that person does despite those things that's more powerful. So spending a lot of time explaining what happened to somebody or doing flashbacks and all these different things, they take you out of the now. Mm. They take you out of the storyline that's occurring right now, in front of the reader or viewer. And that's really what, what we don't want to do. We want to keep them in the now, focused on what was hap what is happening, how the character is reacting to the things that are happening to them right now. And so I think that's one of the real big dangers of backstory is feeling that you have to just draw all these things in from the past to explain everything so that the person who is watching has enough information that they can move forward now and understand why a character is doing something. It's much better to just show them doing it and add little dribbles along the way if you need to that help sort of round things out for them. Hmm. Very, very cool. And and now there is a danger as as somebody picks up something like the the emotion thesaurus that they're just relying on copy and paste. And so they oh, bearing one's teeth, I'm gonna use that. Or flexing the fingers or arm muscles, that's great, I'm gonna use that. Um that doesn't seem like doesn't seem like the most powerful way to use this tool. Um you mentioned in your book using it as a launching point and also twisting the cliches. Tell me about those things. Uh, well, there's the, the thing about cliches is that they're cliches for a reason. They work. You know, when someone is sad and they're crying, I mean, we all recognize that. We all recognize that that person is sad. But when you use something over and over and over, it, it, it becomes white noise or it becomes boring. And it's really these sort of fresh fresh writing techniques that – really engage us. But, um, yeah, definitely there is a danger with a book like this where somebody could cut and paste. And we tried to warn against that. We've even included uh, some of the cliche responses for each emotion because, you know, they are responses and it, it would, it, we, it would be incomplete had we not included them. But what we try to encourage people to do is to twist these things, to make them their own. So again, it comes back to who is your character, what is their emotional range, and how can you make a certain gesture really a part of who they are so that it doesn't just feel like it's been dumped in there, that someone clenches their fist because they're angry. How can you really sort of integrate that into you know, their dialogue or, or an action that they're doing where it just feels really natural and authentic? Very, very cool. Well, I think uh, that's that's pretty much the end of my questions. I would make one uh, comment, and that's that um, this is actually an excellent book to get on Kindle um, <laughs> because uh, e even the Kindle application on your computer, because th there are hyperlinks that can take you directly to the various emotions, and then, like say for instance, uh, it'll say can also lead to es may escalate to annoyance, frustration, anxiety, anger, and there's more hyperlinks that that can take you uh, around these different emotions. Um, I, I find that really, really, really handy. Of course, there's advantages to a paper version as well, where you can highlight things and circle and make notes and, and that kind of thing. But um, I, Yeah, for sure. For I, sure. I, 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 I almost think there's one I want on paper and on Kindle. <laughs> 
you know, it's funny that you say that because a lot of people do end up buying both. Mm -hmm. Um, we actually sell more in paper than we do on Kindle, but we, we sell, sell significant amounts on Kindle. Um, our goal behind this, behind the electronic version was to give people a resource that would not sort of break the spell. We wanted them, if they got stuck, they could flip on the Kindle, flip through to the entry that they needed right away, see where it goes, get the information they need, and then get right back in the story. Mm. I mean, it, it, for a lot of people, they they need time to sort of get into the mood of writing. And the last thing you want to do is say, oh, I need help here. Okay, I better grab out this book. And then I think, it, I think what I needed was like on page 29, but I'm not sure. We just wanted it to be really simple, really user-friendly for writers because, you know, finding time to write is very difficult for most people. We wanted to maximize the time that they have for writing, not researching. Great. Well, and so as we start to wrap it up, I would um, give a bit of a summary here. So so for, the, for this screenwriter, I think that this can be useful for a number of different things. One of them is definitely for your powers of observation. Um, and this is something that, that we should be doing continually, which is as we're watching people, we're not just watching what they do and what they say, but how does that pertain to emotions? How does their body language, even little ticks, pertain to the emotions at hand? One of them is as a scene tool, which is um, uh, in, in terms of what our act actors are actually doing in the moment and how they can play off and react off each other. Another one is just for the pure readability and language of the script as we, as we write it. Another one is definitely as a rewrite tool, even, even rewriting for yourself, not necessarily showing to somebody else, but as you have finished your draft and then now you're coming back to it, whenever the dialogue starts to feel flat, I think we need to start asking ourselves, well, is there something, is this showing the emotion of the moment and could I show it in a better way, in a more unique way? Could I, could I take this cliche and, and make it not cliche? Um, so, so definitely a number of different uses for this tool. Um, anything else you can think of that you, you would want to add? Uh, I, I will sometimes use it as a placeholder mm -hmm. in the sense that um, I, I have a really intense scene going on and I need to show a certain emotion. I'm drawing a blank, but I'm, I'm so in the moment that I don't want to take too much time away really thinking about it now. I want to keep with the flow of the story. I will just pull a few things out of one of the lists, plop them in, and then keep going. And then as you say, when it's time to revise, come back to that and go, okay, this is the emotion I was going for, but I really want to make it compelling, and how do I do that? And then, to, and then at that point in time, really take the time to think about how I can make it unique. That's, that's a great point. I, I definitely, there's times that, uh, that you do not want to break the flow of your writing, but uh, that, that's a great application too. Um, great. So, so outside of the emotions as sources, is there anything else that you would want to mention before we go? You know, I just, uh, I hope that if any writers out there or screenwriters have any trouble at all with different aspects of writing, especially something that is description centric, please do visit our blog because there are a ton of different resources there free to use for people to, you know, just help them with their editing. There's also a free PDF that we have there that is sort of a companion to the emotion thesaurus. Mm -hmm. And what it is, is it's very similar to, in layout to the emotion thesaurus where it lists the body language thoughts and visceral sensations, but it's for conditions that amplify emotions. So uh, a character's pain, what does that look like? What kind of thoughts go through a character's mind when they're in pain? What are the, the visceral sensations? What's going on inside their body when they feel pain? And so it's for things like that. There's, there's pain, illness, inebriation, um, hunger, just different conditions that will amplify the character's emotional state because they're experiencing them. When you're in pain, you're going to be a lot more reactive to emotion. Or if you're inebriated, you may be you have less inhibition. So, you know, you, you're, you might be easier going with the flow. You might be more expressive than you would be normally. So it's just a kind of a little add on tool for people to use. If they're looking for ways to sort of amp up the emotion and see, they may want to look at it and see if there's something there that will help them. Great, great stuff. Well, that is very, very cool. So definitely check out the bookshelf muse and people can find you on Twitter. 
Absolutely. I have two Twitter handles. One is my name, Angela Ackerman, and that's uh, chit chat and also all the sort of blog posts, uh, writing articles I find, I like to share them there. I also have a second account that is called uh, a Writer Thesaurus, and it is all writing links and tools and resources. So that's a really good one to follow. Each tweet is a link that goes to this really interesting tool that I've found or a really unique uh, resource for a certain area like mystery writers or, or crime scene investigations, all different kinds of genres. I think there's like over 300 links because there's over 300 tweets. Very, so all you very cool. do is follow that. And if you're looking for a particular link on something unusual, you might find it there. Very, very cool. Well, thank you so much for being so generous, generous with your time and also providing this really unique tool that I, I don't know anything else out there that that um, that does this. So very, very cool stuff. Thank you for having me. I think with the Emotion Thesaurus, sometimes when you're really struggling in an area and there's no help available, you have to create a tool to help you. So that's kind of what we did. Very cool. Okay. Well, thanks so much, Angela. Thank you. Okay. Bye-bye. Hosted by Gray Jones, the TV Writer Podcast is brought to you by Script Magazine and ScriptMag.com, the leading source for script writing information in print and on the web.